cuando me digas, vale. Hola, buenos días, pues eh, hoy tengo el placer, gusto, <ríe> de presentar a Miguel Muñoz, que la verdad es que para, para esta casa ya es un viejo conocido, puesto que hizo aquí la tesis, y, y bueno, pues hoy os va a contar un poco lo que hizo después de la tesis. Entonces, eh, bueno, en 2016 estuvo en Stanford, en el grupo de Eric Pop, eh, que son expertos mundiales en, en eh, gestión de calor, y después ha estado en el 2019 y consiguió una plaza en la Universidad de Tuente, donde empezó a formar su grupo de investigación y llegó a conseguir un montón de proyectos de un millón de euros, o sea, una financiación importante, y allí ha llevado a algunos estudiantes, eh, entonces, bueno, pues hoy, um, después de que decidiera volver a España y que volviera otra vez con nosotros a, al Instituto de Micro y Nanotecnología, pues eh, hoy nos va a contar un poco qué es lo que ha hecho en ese periplo de Stanford y la Universidad de Twente. Cuando okay. quieras. Well, thank you, very much, thank you very much, Marisol, for this nice introduction. Um, well, actually, uh, I would also like to, uh, to you know, thank the organizers of these seminars because I wanted to give a talk to somehow give you an idea of what are the research lines that I'm planning to implement in this Institute of Micronotechnology within the group of Marisol Martin Gonzalez. I became recently Scientifico titular, uh, starting in December last year, and I'm also keeping my double affiliation with the University of Twente as associate professor. And today I'm going to focus on these two main topics, energy dissipation, electronics, and advanced thermal management, that, as I mentioned before, this will be part of the research that I'm planning to implement here. Uh, but let's give you a little bit of introduction about the long way that took me, you know, to be back home. And I think I started at the National Physical Laboratory of London, uh, working as an internship there with a Leonardo's grant. This is a European grant. And later on, I started my PhD with a hyperdoc um, grant, also at Physic in the group of Marisol Martin, uh, having different stays in uh, New York, California, or the University of Bordeaux in France. After I finished my PhD, I had the privilege to go to a very well-known university in California, Stanford University, working with uh, Professor Pop as a postdoc. And later on, I got a tenure track assistant, uh, assistant professor position at the University of Twente in the Netherlands, where I had the opportunity to develop there a group of PhDs and, and postdocs in uh, the Faculty of Engineering. So last but not least, I am back to Spain. I'm back to the SIC, which makes me very happy. And today it's very special to see many familiar faces from my time here at the SIC. So let's go, let's start now with the introduction of my talk. And I would like to, to show you the, my motivation for doing the research that I do today. And I'm taking this slide from my former supervisor, Professor Pop. And here I saw uh, the CPU power density over the years. And when we talk about electronics, what we see is that since 2005, these electronics are limited by power, but especially also by heat. So heat is having an impact in the performance of these electronics, in the performance of these CPUs. And that's actually very relevant. And when we look at devices individually, what we observe is that these devices, depending on whether we are talking about transistors, memories, these kind of devices can heat up from a few degrees to a few hundreds of degrees. Well, if you put billions of them, for example, in a CPU, what we, you observe is that all the heat that is coming from these individual electronics is going to be considerable. And these pictures actually illustrate that the heat that is coming from there is actually enough, or can be enough, to boil an egg. Now, if we keep on scaling up our electronics and we keep on piling up these electronics, and that's the case for data centers, you can imagine that this, this kind of problem is going to be increased exponentially. And if we look at the numbers, what we observe is that the power that we actually put there for cooling is even more than the power that, for example, we use for servers. So that gives us an idea, like also, also especially like looking from the point of view of sustainability, that that's something that we need to deal with very seriously. And that has taken some data centers, like Google, to move their data centers to cold places in order to cool down their electronics more efficiently. 
With this in mind, at the University of Twente, uh, there was, in the Center of Energy of Innovation, we started a new program dedicated to low energy data centers, in which is a consortia of different types of industries and different types of academics working in this field. And I was actually leading the part related with thermal management to make these kind of data centers more efficient. So this is a very hot topic nowadays, and my interest in this is to actually try to gain a more thermal insights about how our electronics dissipate heat, and more importantly, how we can actually manage this heat in a more efficient way in order to actually have an impact to our electri electrified future. Having said that, the kind of research group that I was developing at the University of Twente and the research lines that I'm also going to bring here at the Institute of Microelectronics are dedicated to the characterization of heat dissipation in individual electronic devices, more focused on novel type of devices, for example, those made in 2D materials. Um, there is another part that is related with novel ways of doing heat management, and in this particular case, I'm talking about solid state devices that can actually manage heat in a way of how the electronic counterparts can actually manage heat, for example, thermal diodes, thermal transistors, or novel types of thermal routers, which I will be explaining some of them today. And last but not least, I was working also at the University of Twente in a line related with energy harvesting that uh, is a possibility of converting this part of this waste heat into electricity. That's also something that Marisol has done for many years, and especially I will be bringing these two lines into this group. So regarding the first line, I have a PhD that is now shared between the University of Twente and FASIC that is working, is a, they're working especially on using AFM techniques or atomic force microscopy technique to characterize the heat dissipated in some type of memory devices. And with this, I have different kind of collaborations here in Europe and also USA, uh, uh, but also, for example, in, in Saudi Arabia, in which they actually can fabricate the devices for us to characterize. Regarding the energy management or heat management, um, I have a postdoc working on developing some of these type of uh, thermal devices. We also were recognized recently with a review paper on this film. This is also something that is emerging and that has started in the last five, seven years. And I have a strong collaboration also with the University of Ljubljana in this topic. Last but not least, a project that just finished was a cooperation uh, with industry, with Embraer, the third largest aircraft uh, manufacturer, in which we were using uh, thermoelectric generators in order to harvest part of the heat that is dissipated in aircraft, convert it into electricity, and try to reduce the carbon footprint or the consumption of fuel in aircraft in this particular case. So this is under patent pending, and I think about thermoelectrics, I mean, Marisol, probably you know a lot about this field because Marisol is here in this institute, so I will not talk about this topic today, and I will focus in this too. And let me start with the first topic. The first topic is related with the measurements of energy dissipation in electronic devices, as I introduced before. And before we go into that topic, I think it's important to have a perspective of how we measure temperature. When we look at the bulk scale or like um, micro scale, let's say, we can always use a thermometer that we approach to a hot body and then that will be, give us a temperature reading. That seems simple. However, when we go to the nano or micro scale, the size of the thermocouple could be larger than what we want to measure or, uh, for example, the presence of interfaces make these or make these analyses much more complex. So we need to come up with novel ways of actually characterizing thermal properties of, your, of our samples uh, using different platforms. And one example, one classical example is electrothermal methods. In electrothermal methods, what you do is to, you use a metal line, for example, that can be heated up or can also be used as a sensor. And that allows you to characterize, for example, the thermal properties of different types of materials, like the thermal conductivity, or just to explore some phenomena like, for example, the like phonon, uh, phonon drag in two-dimensional electron uh, gases in this kind of algal gametter structures. But the problem here is that these do not provide a thermal map. And if we want to measure the heat dissipation in electronic devices, we require of a spatially resolved device thermometry. So for that purpose, you can use optical based techniques, for example, infrared thermometry, that is diffraction limited with a spatial resolution of around five micrometer. And this typically allows larger scale temperature maps of some sort, some type of devices. 
If you want to improve a little bit the resolution, then you can use another optical based technique, Raman thermometry. And in this case, it's a very interesting technique because you can actually get a 3D temperature map of your devices. On one hand, this is an MOS2 device. In here you can see the different layers that present Raman signature and you can get temperature at the different layers. That actually give, uh, give, allows you to do some characterization of some properties like thermal interfaces or how the device actually heat up. But if you are more interested in, a, in you know, high resolution, you can use some type of atomic force microscopy based techniques. And here I'm bringing today the scanning thumb microscopy. This is a technique that also we have uh, in this institute, in the, in the Finders group. And here what we observe is that we basically, this technique use a nanoscale tip that can be used both as heater or as a sensor. And that allows you to observe very small heating features in your devices. Let me focus on this technique, which is what brings me here today. And as I mentioned, uh, this is a nanoscale uh, tip that can work both as heater or as a sensor. Typically, or one example of this type of probes are uh, thermoresistive probes. That means uh, these type of probes, which actually have a metal line, in which if you flow a current through this metal line and you induce Joule heating, then the tip will heat up. But also, if you flow a very small current through it, then you can use it as a sensor, because these kind of the electrical resistance of these uh, lines actually depend on the temperature of the probe. So if you flow a sufficiently low current through it to uh, try to avoid overheating, or sorry, heating of this probe, then you can also use this as a sensor. Typically, uh, this, you connect these probes into a wisdom bridge. In this wisdom bridge, uh, what you can actually measure are changes in, this elect in the electrical resistance of the probe, which are measured with the variations in the voltage of the bridge. When you put this probe in this wisdom bridge, uh, and you, for example, flow uh, enough current to the probe to heat up, and you approach it to the surface of the sample, then you are going to have an exchange of heat between the probe and the sample surface. Depending on the thermal conductivity of the probe, then you will have different thermal, th sorry, thermal heat flux <coughs> change. That will result in different temperatures of the probe, and I, consequently, that will result in different variations or in variations of the electrical resistance of the probe. That's what we can actually measure uh, in the Wisdom Bridge. That allows you to obtain simultaneously a topographic image of your sample and also a thermal map of that sample. Here you see two different domains in the thermal map, one with higher contrast and another one with lower contrast, and these correspond to two different thermal domains. So this, is, uh, this example is a carbon fiber epoxy composite with two regions, one more conductive and the other less conductive. The challenge of this technique is that this is given in millivolts. So this is not a direct reading of temperature. And that's one of the greatest challenges of this technique. But in addition to actually heat up the probe to actually obtain these kind of uh, thermal maps, qualitative thermal maps, you can also use that as a sensor, as I explained before. And one example in which we have used this probe as a sensor is in this type of GST uh, memory devices, germanium, antimony, and tellurium. This type of memory devices switch between two different states, one that is crystalline and one that is non-crystalline, and the heat less, or the self-heating of this probe or the heating effects in this probe is actually behind the operation of these type of memories. So here, what we wanted to see with the sky and thermal microscopy is how the heat is actually dissipated. And for that, we have this kind of planar, de uh, planar device in which we have platinum electrodes here. In the middle, we have a GST channel and a capping layer on top to avoid shorts, short or like thin capping layer on top to avoid shorts between the probe and the sample surface. So we get the thermal bias when we don't apply any power to the device, but we also is practically flat thermal map of this device. However, as soon as we start uh, uh, flowing current and applying some power to this device, we start observing how this device heats up. And this already, this qualitative maps is already indicating that we have some interficial problem there between the contact and the GST that is causing very localized heating at the contacts. And also we can get a profile of how the device heats up uh, from a general perspective. That already gives some indications on how you can actually do uh, thermal engineering in these kind of devices to improve their performance. 
but I think still we are limited by the fact that we are not having direct measurements of temperature. In order to do that, there are many different approaches. But one potential approach is to combine this technique with high spatial resolution with something like Raman thermometry. Raman thermometry, if you do a calibration process on that, you can actually get also the profile in these kind of devices. This is the profile that you obtain with the, with the Raman thermometry. You can see here the temperature reading, in gray uh, the contacts, and in the middle the GST channel. But already here, you realize that the resolution that you can have at the contact is you know, limited by the technique itself. However, taking into account these quantitative measurements, you can now use that to calibrate or to obtain temperature readings of your STHM. And in this case, you can actually see that the profile or the heating at the contact is actually better resolved. With these type of profiles, you can actually obtain important parameters for these to understand how the heat dissipates in these devices, like a thermal boundary conductance between the GST and the substrate silicon oxide. There are other also parameters that you can obtain with this profile, like for example, the thermal power in these devices that give you an overview of what you can actually, how you can actually tune some of the properties of your device to do thermal engineering and to improve this kind of performance. But this is, this is uh, one approach that you can use in some planner devices, some you know, that are convenient to use the STHM, but there are some other situations in which uh, are actually more challenging uh, to characterize the heat in some of these devices. And one example is are the well-known memory devices that are resistive random access memory devices that for those who are not familiarized consist on the following. This is an example of type of memory that is made of halving oxide uh, and you see this layer sandwiched between two platinum electrodes on top of silicon oxide and silicon substrate. Well, the way these type of memories work is as follows. If you apply a bias in between these two electrodes, what you observe is that you start with a high resistive state. Of course, this is an oxide. And what you observe is that you apply uh, uh, some bias to it, and you observe that the current that flows through is very small. However, as soon as you reach a value of the bias, you have a spike of current, and you go from the high resistive state to the low resistive state. That is caused by like, a filament that is formed, mix, like it's a junction of different oxygen vacancies that form, in between the top electrode and the bottom electrode, and where the current flows. And the current flows there in a space in the, or in a diameter of this filament that is only a few nanometer diameter. The, the power that flows through something that small and the current that flows through that causes these filaments to heat up enormously. And so far, there have been only some theoretical models that were trying to explain how much the heating of this filament was. And they were talking about temperatures that were close to 1,000 Kelvin. So we're talking temperatures that might be close, for example, to, to, to the sun, right? But there was no experimental measurements of you know, what was the true heating of these filaments. And that had some consequences, some limitations in the way we understand this technology. So the idea that we had was, OK, what if we use a scanning thermal microscopy to try to characterize what is the heat that is coming from these filaments? And we tried. And what we observe, uh, what we observe is actually whether we were able to resolve the hot spot on top of the electrode that was coming from these uh, small filaments that were formed in the half oxide. That was already very interesting, and we said, okay, let's try to use the same approach as we used before to use Raman thermometry to try to quantify uh, what is the heating that is coming from these filaments. For that, of course, we cannot measure in the platinum. That has that is some of the limitations. So we put a 2D material on top that presented some Raman signature. And then there, what we say is that we kind of observe the heating on top of this electrode. But unfortunately, this is this technique is diffraction limited. So it is averaging over the spot of the Raman. So it's not, it doesn't have enough spatial resolution to truly observe the heating that is coming directly from there. So it's averaging over a certain area. So we need to find a different way to calibrate our STHM that can actually measure or quantify the temperature based on the signals that we're getting here. And that's actually quite challenging. So when we talk about the STHM, we have a very complex process of heat exchange between the probe and the sample surface. And that depends, among other things, on the contact thermal resistance. It depends also on the thermal exchange radius, the area in which the heat is exchanging heat with sample surface and also uh, of some other effects like topographic artifacts. 
So we need to take all this into account. So what we decided to do is to fabricate uh, different metal lines of palladium, which they have very well known temperature coefficient of resistance, allow us to convert based on the power that we apply to this line, what is the temperature of the line. And we develop different line widths that will correspond to different thermal exchange radius between the prop and the sample. So based on that, also these have some, uh, let's say, topographic art, uh, artifacts or topo topographic features between the substrate and the top of the line. And based on that, what we can do is STHM images. We have already see some features, some artifacts caused by these kind of topographic changes between the <coughs> substrate and the line. But also we can also see clearly when we apply some power to this line, how they heat up uniformly. So we know what is the temperature of the line thanks to the TCR or temperature coefficient of resistance. We know what is the STHM voltage of our, uh, or of our measurement, of our technique. And now combining these two and also taking into account into some sort of code that we develop, the artifacts that could come from topographic for different topographic features, we were able to determine a factor that can actually convert the millivolts that we get from our STHM signal into Kelvin. And this is what we observe. Above certain width, so what we have is a very constant uh, factor of conversion from these millivolts to Kelvin, but below a certain value that actually corresponds to the natural th uh, thermal change with you of the prop, what we observe is actually a drop of this of these conversion factor. That is actually key to try to give an answer, to try to actually quantify what is the, hot, what is the temperature of the hot spots that we are observing on the surface. And here is an example of one of these hot spots, and we can see how the temperature of these hot spots actually increases with the temper or with the power that we are applying to the device. That's already very promising, um, but we are measuring actually the temperature at the surface of the electrode, and the filament is actually hidden in between the different layers that we have. So still, we had to use some console modeling, finite element modeling, to fit the temperature profiles that we observe on the surface and based on what we should expect right from the filament on the hafni oxide layer. That already gives some indications of some of the temperatures that, uh, that we could have for this filament, but especially like taking into account 10 nanometer diameter and also taking into account the thermal boundary conductance. So things get already complicated. So we thought, okay, is there a way in which we can vary the thickness of the top electrode to get closer to the filament and at the same time to do an analysis, for example, of the thermal boundary conductance that we have in between, for example, the uh, metal electrodes and what we observe in the interested layer that is the active layer having oxide. With this in mind, we came up with the ultimate solution for a top electrode that was ultra thin and we used single layer graphene on top of this half new oxide. What we observed is that we were able to develop devices that were switching on and off reliably for uh, MOS or for, uh, for with cycles that could actually go up to 200. So we were very satisfied to see that. And we said, okay, now let's see if we can observe again the heating that is at the surface of this uh, top electrode made of graphene. And here you can see again how the hot spot is showing up as we apply power to it. These are steady state maps, but you are already able to obtain STHM reading of these, and, you can, and we can now calibrate this millivolt signal into temperature. And since we did for multiple or for different type of electrodes, for different thickness, we were able to also quantify different parameters, once again, like the TVC or thermal boundary conductance, or for example, the temperature of the filaments and operation of these devices in different conditions. And here, for example, you can see the temperature versus the power. And you can see how it varies depending also on the top electrode that we are using. <coughs> Last but not least, uh, something that we also were able to do is to position this tip on top of the filament that was formed before we were doing a steady state maps, but now if we position the, the tip right where the filament is formed, now we can do IV curves and we can see how, what is the temperature that is reaching these kind of filaments in operando when, for example, we transition from high resistive state to low resistive state and so on and so forth. So this is, uh, I think that was actually very interesting and we published this work in a well-known place.
But, uh, but more interesting than that is that this is giving indication to us for the first time of what is the heating that we have in these kind of devices. And that kind of information is something that we can, for example, use for designing novel 3D architectures of electronics and trying to, for example, avoid thermal crosstalks that could be between sensitive electronics and other type of electronics that are less sensitive to these temperature variations or actually to the heat that is dissipated by other components. With this, actually, I finished the first part of my talk, and now I'm transitioning to, okay, we have heating electronics, but how we can actually manage that for some purposes. And uh, to this, in this part, I, I also like to talk about thermal mismanagement rather than thermal management. And the reason is that when we look at our toolkit of thermal control elements, what we observe is that, that we are mostly limited by thermal resistors and capacitors. If we compare them to electronics, we see that these are very little components that we can actually use to you know, do a more advanced control of heat. And when I refer to that, I would like to give now an example. This is a mobile phone, a Samsung. And what we know is that when we are you know, using different apps in our mobile phone, what we observe is that the temperature uh, of this mobile phone actually varies, depending on the number of apps that we are using, depending on what we are doing with our phone. But at some point, and that happens with some models of Samsung in the past, and I think we are all aware of that, at some point we can have a burst of power in these electronics, and that actually could lead to an overheating of the batteries, causing some sort of explosion. And that has very serious, it's not only that you actually lose your mobile phone, but also it could be a problem for the safety of the user. And it would be great if we could actually control, have a dynamic way of controlling such type of you know, temperature spikes in electronics because that could actually protect better our components and to extend the lifetime and performance of these, of these devices. And for that reason, when I talk about the current uh, thermal components, we all know that we, what a thermal uh, resistance is. Uh, we typically like to talk about transfer function that is basically how the heat flow and thermal bias are represented. And we know that, sorry, that this is actually uh, a line in which the slope is inversely proportional to the thermal resistance of the component. So that means that the higher the thermal conductivity of your element, the better it will conduct heat, and the lower the thermal conductivity is, so then the worse it will conduct heat. Okay? But when we look at other elements that could actually make heat a true thing to actually be controlled, then things get more complicated. The thing is that uh, heat is, you know, our packages of energy with no mass that cannot simply be controlled by electro, uh, electrostatic fields, for example. And that makes the management of heat much more complex. But in the recent years, in the last 10 to 7 years, they have been, uh, this, this field has been emerging with the intention of developing active thermal devices like thermal diodes, regulator switches that can actually provide us with a more advanced way of controlling heat. A thermal diode, for example, is a device that can actually flow heat better in one direction compared to the other. Or in the case of a switch or a regulator, you can actually uh, control the way the heat is propagated uh, from one side to another based on an external parameter like electric field, magnetic field, or pressure, or via temperature. Okay? So this is a, a field that is exploding, and I would like to give some examples of some of these devices that I have been developing or in the you know, current phase of developing right now that actually try to provide this kind of advanced way of controlling heat. And I would like to start with, with the type of passive devices and I will try to explain why in a minute. And this is an example of ultra thin thermal barriers that we developed in the group of Professor Pop at Stanford University. Here what we have, what we thought is about combining different types of 2D materials that could result in a third structure with ultra high thermal conductivity. And for that purpose, we combined graphene with different types of transitional metal decalcadenides. And you can see here high resolution image, uh, TEM uh, image of these uh, layers with very clean interfaces due to the transfer method that we implemented. Due to the different masses that we have in this type of, uh, of transitional metal decalcogenides and in this combination, what we have is a way in which phonons 
especially the acoustic ones, are very difficult to propagate, resulting in ultra high low thermal or ultra high thermal resistance barriers. And what we observe is that with Raman, what we can observe is all the peaks related with the two dimensional materials that we are using. And consequently, if we have all that in one scan, we could try to use Raman thermometry to characterize the thermal resistance of this sample. And here what we were doing is to electrically heat up the graphene as the top layer. And then based on that, we were able to observe with the Raman thermometry, since all of them were presenting a Raman signature, we were able to determine the temperature for each one of these layers. Based on that, we, here you, we plotted the thermal resistance for different combinations of two dimensional materials. And the most impressive part of this thing is that a structure that is only three nanometers thick, their structure that is only three nanometers uh, thick, is able to present a thermal resistance that is actually equivalent to 300 nanometers of silicon oxide. That is very promising, for example, for applications such as thermal barriers. And that's exactly what I did at, at uh, the University of Twente. I submitted a project, the national project in the Netherlands, and later on I was able to, when I knew about the transition uh, to the SIC, I was able to integrate the SIC in a later phase as part of the consortia. And this uh, kind of program also requires the in-kind contribution from different industrial partners. And here I am actually cooperating with these companies, Thales, VDL, Philips, and Inner Energy. And the project consists of the following. So we have, typically we know that batteries can actually overheat and this is a problem. And also in cold environments, what you want is that they do not cool uh, or they do not cool down too much because that could also affect their performance. So with this type of thermal routers, what we do is to connect that into battery stacks, as you can see here, with a block of graphite. And in order heat to be dissipated, once it is guided through graphite to the surroundings, what we want is to isolate that with two dimensional hydro structures and other layers, but trying to keep this flexibility. So thanks to that, you have like fibers or routers that can actually guide heat to specific hot spots. And in these hot spots, you can use other technologies, like for example, thermoelectric generators to convert part of this waste heat into electricity, or in the case that you are in a cold environment, to reverse the operation and provide some heat to, sorry, to the batteries in order to keep them working nearly as a isothermal. This, is, uh, this kind of solid state based um, technology is, results in a compact system, has possibilities for energy harvesting, and actually work, can work both during cooling processes and heating processes. So based on that, um, we want to exploit the hydrodynamic flow of phonons in graphite to actually provide or to use these high thermal conductivities that are observed in the in-plane of graphene, oh, sorry, in graphite. And what we also is commercially available, I think we all know about Hop G graphite that is flat, very good quality, but the problem is that it is very expensive. And here, as you remember, we have some industrial partners, and money is actually a problem for them. So instead, we are going to use another type of gra uh, graphite that is provided by Panasonic. It's rough, it's less, the quality is not as good, but at least it's cheap. So that's actually one of our challenges here. And then we want to, on top of it, develop a thermal insulation that can actually provide us with these thermal routers that can guide heat from one location to another. So I have started with CVD uh, system there at the University of Twente. I need to say that I'm not an expert, so if there are experts, I'm very happy to, to hear your advice. And here what we are doing is actually we have a pocket of sulfur heated up some temperature with this glass flow in there. So we evaporate the sulfur. In a catalytic chamber, we actually produce the, uh, the H2S gas that we need for the rest of the process. Then we have an MO3, uh, another pocket that we heat up at different temperature. And then from once we do these steps, when we can actually grow on top of this substrate of interest uh, directly the MOS2. Here, what we have noticed is that the parameters that uh, we, or that are behind this CVD system, like the MO3 temperature, the use of some organic promoters to actually grow uh, these type of 2D materials, or even the substrate features, result in very different type of growth. So we need to control the partial pressure, the seeds for growth, but also it's very important the challenge that we have in this substrate. As I mentioned, we need to use this Panasonic graphite, and this is highly rough, which makes uh, like depositing their 2D materials very tricky. And to give you an example, 
This is a project that started like two weeks ago, but we have done some preliminary testing a few months ago. And here you have different substrates from, you know, atomically flat silicon oxide on silicon, flat graphite and rough graphite. So if I keep like some of the parameters the same, like the temperature of the MO3, or and we keep also some, you know, seeds for promoting the growth. So what we observe is that, okay, for the atomically flat silicon oxide silicon substrate, we get a nice uniform 2D layer of MOS2. But as soon as we have start playing with you know, carbon and let's say in this case graphite, so then we have different type of coverage, we have more layers, and in the case of very rough graphite, the growth does not happen. Of course, one could think that we can actually increase the temperature, for example, the pocket of MO3, and that results, of course, in the in more growth and more coverage of the, this, this type of graph or rough graphite. But on the other hand, we are going to a number of layers that is perhaps more than what we want, because we want to work with one and two and then grow the nest to the layer on top. So there are, very, there are quite some challenges here. Of course, we are starting, but if someone has some suggestions for this kind of growth, I will be more than welcome to hear them. And now moving on more towards more active control of this heat, I have been working with different type of devices like thermal diodes, also based on one versus few layers of graphene. Um, this will take me some time to explain, but we have also been working with thermal switches. Uh, this can be explained perhaps a little bit uh, faster. So here we have a layer of graphene. On top we have our, for example, STHM probe or some electronics that are being heated up. So that's what the STHM uh, probe represents. And when it, the graphene is suspended, the heat can only f f flow across the pillars. So it has certain thermal resistance, this pillar, and that's, that's actually the only way that the heat can dissipate over the substrate. However, if we switch electrostatically the graphene, what we observe is that we open another path for the heat to flow towards the substrate. And then the thermal resistance here is actually lower, and then you can switch between on and off states to facilitate heat you know, to be dissipated to the substrate or to retain that. That could actually solve the example, for example, that I mentioned related with with the batteries, for example, in mobile phones. But today I'm bringing a more specific example dedicated to thermal diodes, so thermal rectification. As I explained before, a thermal diode is capable to flow heat better in one direction compared to another. Typically, when we talk about these devices, we talk about rectification ratio. That means how well this device is able to rectify heat. And some examples in literature have been the junction of materials in which the thermal conductivity has a dependence or a different dependence at some range of temperature. For example, this graphite will be, for this range of temperature, will go up, but this quartz will go down. So what happens here is that depending on, on the gradient, how you apply the gradient, you can be taking the highly thermal conductive parts of the materials, but when you reverse the gradient, you, will be, you can be in the lower part of the thermal conductivity of these materials. And that allows very, well, sorry, very high rectification ratios, but the problem is that actually this typically happens at low temperature. Differently, you can actually use now technology to engineer some materials and to develop, for example, these uh, graphene, triangular shapes, and in this case, the physics are a little bit more complicated, but here what happens is that when you go from one direction, here's the easy direction to flow heat, but when you go in the other direction, you can have some sort of, you know, funnel bottleneck on the, on the narrower part that actually induce some sort of rectification ratio. This rectification has been relatively moderate with values of around 11%, uh, but actually at temperatures that can be applied something close to the room temperature. Today, I'm, one another example that could be used is related with phase change materials. And in this case, I think we are all familiarized with VO2, of vanadium dioxide. And what we know from these materials is that we can go from a monoclinic, monoclinic insulating phase to a tetragonal metallic phase. This is typically used in electronics also, but in addition to the change in the electronic properties, that also actually induces a change in the thermal properties of your material. That's an example of how, for example, uh, films with different thickness can actually have this jump of thermal conductivity. However, per se, you can see that that change in pure VO2 is relatively very moderate and very difficult to apply actually as a thermal regulator or thermal switch. Instead, what people have done is to combine this type of materials with other non, or this type of phase change materials with others that are non-invariant phase change materials. 
So that means an example could be Sapphire. So when you combine these two, you can actually gain some control also across the temperature gradient that you have in your sample. So when you have the hot temperature on this side, the vanadium, and that is actually higher than the critical temperature in which the material change phase, then this part will be uh, fully in the high thermally conductive state, and that actually will remain with its temperature. However, when you reverse this, uh, this gradient of temperature and you put the hot side on this part, and you have a gradient of temperature in the sapphire, the temperature that actually is across that is below the phase change uh, transition temperature expected for this view too. And consequently, the thermal conductivity here would be lower of the whole structure compared to this case. That actually leads to some rectification effects and people have exploded this kind of combination. The idea that we developed at the University of Twente was to actually perfection this method. And what we did is to combine different layers of phase change materials with very defined you know, temperatures for their phase change transition in order to optimize the performance of these kind of diodes and to be able to scale them up. So here we, we use different, uh, these silver, sulfur, selenite uh, materials with silver tellurides also materials and with different materials that are phase invariant like silicon, silicon oxide for example, that can be also reproduced and can be grown in the lab and we explore how these were working with finite element modeling. Here you see the uh, continuous line corresponds to the high thermal conductive state and the other one, the dotted line, corresponded to the phase or to the part of this device in which is conducting less. And based on these, what we were observed, we observed values, for example, for temperature gradients between 500 and 300 Kelvin, that was around 120%. This is already very promising. We also uh, explore is the, the dependence of these with the gradient, fixing the cold side to 300 Kelvin and increasing the temperature of the hot source uh, to something like 550. And we were able that not only you can actually have uh, high values of rectification, but you can also modulate that based on the temperature that you, that you, that of the hot source, right? And very importantly to me, and especially working on this uh, faculty of engineering and also that inspires part of my research is how can we go from this kind of fundamental research towards something more applied. And the idea of developing this type of diode and to have this multi-layer and to scale up and to have something that is tangible and that you can apply is to explore where this could be integrated. And something that we explore also here uh, theoretically was the case for thermal storage also another hot topic these days. When we talk about thermal storage, we have a layer on the, on the surface that actually uh, protects, in many cases, for heat to be dissipated to the surroundings. So if you want to charge this thermal storage, you have a thermal resistance at this layer. And then when you want to retain this heat, you are also limited by the thermal resistance that you have in this tank. However, with the diode, you have some sort of a smart way of like passing charging the, the thermal storage in which you facilitate uh, heat to flow inside of the thermal storage tank. But now when you try to retain that heat, then you have the diode in the other configuration. So the heat actually dissipates much less the environment. So with this, you can actually compare the case with and without the diode. For the charging case, we can see the same type of thermal resistance for both the diode and uh, the layer that is there. But you can see that with uh, the diode, actually you have more possibilities to retain heat in the, long in the long term. And here you can actually even say that or see that as you cycle this type of thermal tanks and you charge and discharge, it can actually work better in the long term. So this is an opportunity to do what I call some sort of a smart thermal management. And there is a lot, a lot of research that is going in this kind of direction and that I hope that it has an impact in the technology and also this is where I want my contribution to be towards the, the green transition that we have ahead of us. Okay, so with this I would like to conclude my talk. I try to show you a little bit uh, the capability that could be used for example for energy dissipation of electronic devices and mostly related with atomic force microscopy based technique and how I have used in the past that's also my idea to do that here. We can also work in active mode for quantifying also the thermal properties with the, with the NFM that actually uh, Marisol has in her lab and that also works in combination with 3Omega. And uh, also I wanted to you know, give you 
a little bit of you know a peek of what I am doing in the field of thermal management and um, I'm very happy to explore also opportunities in this direction from the point of view of applications beyond electronics or thermal storage but also like I talked to Ripi this could also be interesting for example from the point of view of solar cells to facilitate heat to be dissipated from these solar cells but not to get back to, to them. Thank you very much you all for listening. I would like to thank all my collaborators, PhDs and postdocs that are working right now. There's another PhD that is starting now in this project with the Netherlands. To the group of Marisol Martin uh, for actually hosting me in, in the Finder group and for all the funding that, I, uh, that is active at the moment and that is helping me to do my research. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you to you, Miguel. And actually, if the reason why we have the, the STH in our group is because you did it in your PhD. Yeah, in some of it. <laughs> okay, so uh, time is open for questions. Okay. Nice talk and congratulations on Thank your you achievements. Um, you comment that this amazing uh, ten image that you've, you've shown, where you have the heterojunctions with different uh, two D materials, uh, is because uh, you've managed to to do the deposition in, in a special way. Could you please con comment a little bit on that? Yes, I mean actually the the growth of these materials were also uh, done by CVD. CVD. They were done independently, uh -huh. so in different, in different furnaces. But I think the most important, or the trick for having these clean interfaces is that you always have this kind of residue on top that you put in the 2D material, right? And then that leaves residues. In here, what we did is first, we catch the graphene layer, and then with that assist, we went to the next one. So let's say to the MOS2, and then to the WSC2. And then they were sticking directly on graphene. And that layer is clean. So the top one, the top one with graphene, there might be some residues, and you mm -hmm. can clean it as much as possible. But the ones in between, mm -hmm. they were perfectly clean. Okay. And that, I think, it was a trick. So they were sticking to each other. Great. Thanks. Very nice talk, Miguel. Thank you so much. I was wondering if uh, the word thermotronics exist because this is what you are trying to do. I mean, uh, you are mimicking electronics using thermal elements, using uh, heat. Yeah. Well, I think that term has been used also when you, fr when you look from the point of view of mechanics, you could also do a thermal switch. The one that I presented on graphene, it was also more mechanical, right? In this case, still electrostatics involved there, but there were moving patterns, right? Uh, for fluids, you can also do the same. If you have a fluid that is conducting uh, in a pipe, you can actually stop the fluid and then the heat transfer that would be corresponding to the air, whatever you have there. But when you flow the fluid, you can actually have a nice switch. This kind of terminology, I think, has been applied in this kind of direction. Uh, I'm mostly interested in solid state, but I think you, can st you could still call it thermotronics. So <laughs> this is a nice parallelism. I can, I can it, thank you. It's quite a nice talk. What's, how different is thermal conductance in, uh, I mean, because these heterostacks seem quite complicated, uh, all the more when it is so rough, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so I was wondering, what's the difference between, say, so the main advantage is you can get it really thin, thermal insulating. And uh, how does this heterostack compares with Philips graphite? Yes, actually, it's a good question. One thing is that the structure itself, right? It has a thermal conductivity that is lower than air, uh, based on our calculations and based of our experimental results, right? And it provides also flexibility to this graphite. If you put it there, it still is flexible, it's very thin, it's very compact. Uh, there are some challenges, I think, associated to thermalization. I think we will need to take care of that because we cannot pile up 100 layers in the end. So we have come up with some ideas for multi-layering of this. Um, but I think 
yes, the graphite is rough. It's gonna be, it could be a problem. But we are actually exploring ways on how we could also take advantage of this roughness on graphite to exploit this kind of effect, to try, in the end, we want to condensate that heat flowing only through graphite, right? So if we have something that is symmetric, we are actually contributing to that, right? To flow the heat in the core of graphite and trying to prevent that to dissipate to the surroundings. Is this more or less what you were asking? No, not really. So I was wondering, when you compare a natural structure, like uh, with MOS2, graphite, with all these different stacks, uh -huh. versus graphite, because the, you made the comparison of this extra structure with, with uh, morpho silicon. Yes. And you say, look, with three nanometers thick uh, substrate, we can get much better thermal insulation yes. than 300. And I was wondering uh, if graphite alone would not suffice, maybe not three, but five nanometers. I mean, do you want to put them? So no, no. D just how how this extra structure okay. compares yes. with with five micrometer. For example, there is a work from Machida et al. from Nature in which they have explored what is the thermal conductivity of graphite as you reduce the thickness. So they were measuring minimum, I think, something like five micrometer or eight micrometer. That was actually a Nature, and what they were they observed is that actually it's very anisotropic, and then you have in plane values of thermal conductivity of graphite that could go to 4,000 watts per kilometer. I think that was why it was a nature. And in the anisotropic point of view, so for example in the cross plane, which is mm -hmm. the one that we want to exactly. isolate, eh? we want the heat to avoid mm -hmm. dissipation in, in the out of plane, right? That was still like something like 10 or 12 watts per kilometer. So still, of course, you have the factor H of heat transfer to the surroundings, but what we are trying to do, or to, uh, trying to avoid is that factor H, you know, to be the height, because if you put graphite, and you can see in the videos of Panasonic, and you put a flame directly there, immediately the heat actually also dissipates, mm -hmm. right? So we want to prevent that effect. So there are two things, in plane, with very high thermal conductivity, and the cross out of plane, that is incomparable, incomparable with what you are saying, mm -hmm. orders of magnitude is smaller in this direction, to prevent heat to dissipate. And just one last question, it's very sure. quick. What is the spatial resolution that, that you, you... With STHM? Exactly. With STHM is tricky because um, you show the... Um, if you remember, I showed the conversion factor, right? So the conversion factor depends also on the thermal exchange that you have between the tip and the sample surface, okay? So if you, I, can, I, can, I can show the slide. Let's see if it doesn't take too much time. I think it's faster with this. I think I can type also the slide, but I don't remember the number. Because this is actually an interesting question. And here, this one. So here what you see is that the conversion factor is constant above a value that is around 200 nanometers. Okay, that is, is this corresponds also to the width of the line. Mm -hmm. If you measure the thermal change radius between the prop and the sample surface, the standard one, for example, you heat up the probe. This corresponds, in this case, to this area. And when I talk about thermal exchange radius, is the area in which the tip is exchanging heat with the sample. That's the area. That's basically the radius. Hmm. So then what you see is that more or less is constant for different widths. After you achieve um, you know, a width of the line with enough, then this, the area remains. The part with which you mainly exchange heat with the tip that is coming from the surface is more or less the same. And that this kind of value at which it is starting to you know, go down corresponds also to the natural thermal change radius, to the typical change radius of the tip with the surface. That is around 200 nanometer too. Mm -hmm. However, that would be your, your true spatial resolution of the tip from the thermal point of view. But as soon as you go down, you truncate that. And the heat transfer mechanisms around the vicinity of the tip are starting to change. You don't have the water meniscus completely, so it's smaller than the water meniscus, so all the different parameters that actually contribute to all that. And that actually, if you ask me purely what is the thermal resolution of the technique, I would say 200. Mm -hmm. But if you do the analysis properly of calibration, you can actually get these kind of conversion parameters that allow you to go 
below these resolutions. Okay. I think Julio is closed. Nice talk. So Thank my you. question is also related with this complex interchange of heat between the tip and the substrate and the sample. So for instance, when you heat up the sample high enough, let's say above 100 degrees, that is the boiling temperature of water. Yes. Do you see a difference? Yes, that's, we, yes, that's actually very tricky. Because, because that is going to cause different type of thermal drifts, is going to actually change the type of interaction that you have between the probe and the sample surface. And that's why we were also trying to calibrate at different temperatures with these kind of lines to see how to account for these kind of parameters. Parameters also like the pressure that you put between the probe and the sample surface are going to also affect. And this is, this is one of the nightmares of this technique and, uh, but if it was easy, it would have already been done. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. uh, thanks, Miguel, for the nice and interesting talk. Thank you, Paolo. Just also going further with these calibration things, uh, in the previous slide, you mentioned you used the temperature coefficient, uh, the TCR. Of the palladium lines. Yeah. Yes. Uh, do you use a fixed value or? Do no, no, no. That was actually calibrated experimentally for each one of the lines because there could be variations, or small variations between the lines, and we did that for, for all of them. Mm -hmm. It's the same for each prop. So we don't account only for this kind of calibration factor for all of them. No, you need to do it you calibrate to each, each one of them because each one of them might actually change slightly the geometrical profile or, you know, they could be slightly different. And that's actually very tedious. This technique, again, it could be found commercially, but the calibration is, is truly what so, makes uh, it all. Once you calibrate one of these probes, you just rely on that calibration for that probe, more to or less? Some extent, so, to I some think extent. I think there is, uh, typically I'll, I work, so there are some indications when you have taken so many ST time measurements, you can actually already indicate when you have changes in the ST time. For example, you're getting a thermal map and you start seeing that the background signal is already changing. Uh, you can do the offsets you know better than anyone, like the offset in different fits and so on, but you can already see if it changed too much, then that is coming, you know, it could be some, the property has changed slightly, and then you should do the calibration again. Mm -hmm. Typically it works well, you know, rule of thumb, something like 100 images is more, is more or less reliable, but it also depends on the type of devices that you measure, whether they are flat or whether you have edges that are too sharp and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So it depends on many different things, it's very tedious. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Paolo. Hi. Um, yeah, my question was really related to this calibration, but I was more wondering if... So what, what you measure here is a change in the current or in the voltage, and you relate it to change in the, res in the resistance. Mm -hmm. But then to calculate the temperature, you need to pass to resistivity, I suppose. Well, yeah, there are many different ways of doing that. For example, if you use this kind of thermoresistive probe in active mode, you can combine it with a 3 omega mode. Uh, and this 3 omega method, basically the response that you get from the 3 omega, 3 omega voltage, you can also convert it into temperature. And once you have the temperatures, then you can actually get in the end to, for example, the values of, uh, of thermal conductivity of the sample. But um, because I was wondering if at these dimensions, uh, since you move from resistance to resistivity or conductance to conductivity, you need to take into account geometrical parameters and material parameters as well. Yes. So my question is, can you do this kind of relation, just counting from the dimension of the, of the tip and then the shape? Yes. Or there are like uh, microscopic yes. effects, like the presence of a lot of surfaces compared to the volume that makes... There are, there, are, there are models that actually take into account all the geometrical parameters. So you need to think that, for example, from the uh, heat transfer, you can actually simplify it to some thermal resistances in which you have the water meniscus thermal resistance, that you have radiation thermal resistance, that you have conduction between solid and solid, uh, contacts between the tip and the sample surface, and also the convection around that. So all mm -hmm. these could be your thermal network, right? Yeah. And uh, there, has be, there have been also tries in modeling this kind of heat transfer process. Uh, 
but with model you always rely on model, right? So I think it's better to, I have actually, if you're very interested in this, in this field, I have a review paper in which I deal with all these different kind of setups that could be, that could be used, calibration, models that people have used to actually try to understand this heat transfer process and to try to simplify that. But in my view, and after certain years, there is not a simple way of simplifying. <laughs> you need to yeah. go to the lab, do the calibration, one by one, one by one tip, you know, and get, you can use some model in combination with experimental part, but you should not only rely on the model. It's mm -hmm. in some cases an oversimplified way of looking at this. Okay, thanks. Any further questions? Okay, if not, uh, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you so much. Thank you.